Hello, my name is David Oxenham. Uh, this is an educational video that we've created with the help of a patient's husband to help think through some of the difficulties around DNA CPR decision making. My name is Mike Cunningham. I am 82 years old, as is fairly obvious from the, the white and silver hair. I met at the Empire Ballroom in Leicester Square, the, 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 the lady who became my wife. I danced with her for 10 seconds, and after seven of those seconds, I determined that this was the woman that I wished to spend the rest of my life with. Jacqueline and I got on like a house on fire. She was, she was funny, she was sexy, she was very intelligent. She eventually agreed to marry me, and we were married in October 1967. During my time at sea, I was down in South Africa, and I was so impressed with that country that I persuaded Jacqueline to come with me and make a life overseas in South Africa. We had three children, two boys, one girl, who are now fabulous. Some six, nine months after the birth of our daughter, my wife, she was exhibiting symptoms which I didn't really understand. Suddenly realized that the signals that I was taking as just being Jacqueline in our moment, it was something more, more than that. And she was then assessed by two senior psychiatrists and I was told bluntly, in no uncertain fashion, that my wife was ill, she was suffering from schizophrenia, and she had to be admitted to hospital that day. And there I was asked to commit before a magistrate my wife into the tender care of the psychiatric institution. But fortunately, after two odd months, my wife came out virtually, virtually brand new. That little sparkle had maybe been, was maybe missing from her eyes, but that was my wife back to me. She taught all my kids to read and write to such an extent that they were miles ahead. The teachers remarked when all three of my kids went into their, school, their classes. All times change, all things change in South Africa. And I decided to leave and go back to Britain. Jacqueline started to fall away from going to her um, uh, monthly meetings with the psychiatrist. And she also began to not take her medication properly. I got her into um, a, a, a program with County Hospital, which was um, the mental health centre for Durham. And I thought I'd cracked it. But unfortunately, of course, I was working away and I wasn't able to keep an eye on Jacqueline all the time. Over the, the three decades since we came back, she did get worse. I, I, was, I was forced to give up work in the end because Jacqueline was totally dependent upon me. I approached the council for uh, a stair lift. The bathroom was, was renovated into a wet shower room and I was able to wheel Jacqueline into the shower room, the, the, the room, and, 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 and things got better. In, in the end, uh, the, the council also arranged for a, a hoist to be put in Jacqueline's bedroom. Jacqueline became frailer, and in early May last year, I went down and I made a cup of tea for myself, and Jacqueline had a, a, a special cup so she could take a drink when she was sitting on the edge of the bed. Of the bed. And I was just, just into drinking my own tea when I heard the thump 
and Jackie had fallen out of the bed. The, one of the problems with this was that Jacqueline had virtually lost the power of speech. But she was able to, to indicate that, I think it was her, uh, I think it was her, her left hip area was very painful. The ambulance people agreed that there was something really badly wrong and she should be transferred to the a and &E department at the hospital. The ambulance people's uh, diagnosis of a fractured hip was correct and my wife was in need of surgery. Bless her heart, she, she did her best, but she was frail, very frail. And this young doctor said, there are risks, but the risks are not from the surgery, but from the anaesthetic. She says, general anaesthetic can be dangerous, especially with people who are frail and infirm. But if they're, if they're strong enough, fair enough. And Jacqueline nodded to me and I gave my consent. But I would stress at this point that nothing else, nothing else was discussed with me or in my wife's presence. Nothing, no other risks or formalities were ever discussed with me during that meeting with that young doctor. I had a lasting power, I think it's a lasting power of attorney for everything. And that was, I was, that was how I was able to agree for the operation to take place. Later that evening, I was phoned up and this bloke comes on on, on a three minute monologue about how, how some people do not take resuscitation very well and how they have a lower quality of life after resuscitation. At no point did this mention the acronym DNACPR. I was phoned up the next morning and I was told that Jacqueline was going in for surgery and I was phoned up again by uh, I forget who was a member of the team who called me and said my Jacqueline had come through the operation. She had taken a cup of tea or a drink of tea and she was resting. I was overjoyed. Somewhere around about seven o'clock, odd eight o'clock, way thereabouts, somebody phoned me up and bluntly told me that Jacqueline had died. A grief to me, as a foreigner. I mean, I've known sadness. My father, my mother died. My sister died of leukemia. But I was, I was rocked. I've never, ever, ever experienced anything like the grief. And I got better, slowly but surely. And I was almost, I would say, back to somewhere what passes for normality. When I was called up by uh, the, the coroner's clerk the, and, and told that because Jacqueline's de Jacqueline had died unexpectedly, there would be an inquest. In the hospital report, signed by a doctor, that Jacqueline had come through the operation but had had a heart attack. And because there was a DNAR document on her bedside file, no further action was taken to save her life. This loss came over me again. I was absolutely gobsmacked. Okay, she had the operation, but she died and nothing could be done. And I was not told. This was my wife. This was my life. This was 53 years.
when I was on the witness stand, under oath, under affirmed oath, that I would tell the truth. I told the truth, and I said that I was never, ever told. There were allusions to people with difficulties, and some, some people had a lesser quality of life, but nothing, nothing else. I got a final letter from um, the, the, the then, uh, I think, deputy head of the trust, stating that this was the, this was the, the statement that, I mean, they had, they had said yes, they, they, there had been problems, and um, they sent their condolences, and that was it. And, and I, I said, no, I mean, I, I thought to myself, no, I, I will not be brushed off. Now, I know that you have compression techniques, which I doubt very, very much my wife would even withstand because she was so frail. But I do know that the electrical, the, the, the defibrillator, if my wife had been monitored properly and consistently, if my wife, if, if, this, if this heart attack had happened, and if she was being properly monitored, and the, this DNA, DNAR document had not been on her file, certainly an attempt would have been made. My wife should have been given a chance. And if she didn't survive, there be it, so be it. But she should have been given the chance so that she'd maybe come home to me. It's, it's a matter of humanity. The decision about uh, do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation is one that we should think about uh, for anyone where you might anticipate that their heart might stop. So that means that if you're 20 and come in with a broken toe, we probably shouldn't think about uh, a resuscitation attempt uh, or, or a, a resuscitation decision. But uh, for most people who come into general medical wards in, in the trust, for more, most people at home who are older or frailer, and you think, and, and there's a, so I can see a situation where their heart might stop, then you should think about a, a cardiopulmonary uh, resuscitation decision, about a DNA CPR decision. And the first thing that we want to think about is whether we believe that a resuscitation attempt would work or not, by which means at the end of that attempt, would the person be alive? The key thing that we need to consider, because if it might work, then that's a discussion that we need to have with the patient, or if the patient doesn't, isn't able to have that discussion, it lacks capacity, then with the, with the family, with the people who know the patient. But quite a lot of people, the, um, uh, the answer to that will, might it work question is no, it won't work. And in that situation, we're not wanting to offer that to someone as a choice because uh, there isn't a choice about it. If it won't work, then we, we won't, we can't be uh, offering that thing. Just as if, if my head falls off, then uh, no one's going to say, oh, shall we stitch it back on again? Uh, because it won't work. And so we don't offer that to people as a, as a, as a a thing that looks like it's a choice. So we shouldn't offer people choices where there's no choices. Um, so that's the first thing that we, that we consider is, uh, might it work? Uh, if it won't work, then we don't offer it as a choice. And then it's a breaking bad news conversation. And doctors are taught how to do breaking bad news. Uh, and you start off making sure that you have the right information and that you're in the right setting, uh, that you know what you're going to say you assess the understanding of the person who you're speaking to, uh, what do they understand about their own situation. Uh, in this situation, what does um, the, the, the patient's partner, patient's husband understand about 
uh, his wife's situation, uh, and and having made sure that we are on the same page uh, about that, then you go on to explain that although we will do everything that we can to make this person better, we there are some things that won't work, and that we should. And, and then you go on to explain that uh, uh, when uh, that if something won't work, then we won't be able to do it. Some found that some people do switch off once you once you've said something terrible or something that they're very distressed by. Some people do just don't hear anything else you say. So in general, when I'm when I'm doing this, then I will. Uh, make sure, assess their understanding, make sure that we understand the, sa the situation the same as much as possible. Uh, and then I'll explain that I want to talk about things that, that might happen in the future, you know, serious things that might happen in the future. Uh, and, and if they're all right for discussing that, then I will say that I, I want to talk about uh, treatments that might or might not work in the future, that will or won't work in the future, in my opinion. Uh, and I'll probably start by saying, as it stands, if there is anything that we can do for your wife that will make her better, that will, uh, that will make her well again, then we will do those things. And most people agree to that. Uh, and then I'll say, but if there are things that won't work, we don't want to do those things. And we can't do those things because they won't work. So is it all right if I talk to you about some of the things that we now because of how ill your, your wife is and because of all of what we know about her health, things that we think won't work. And the most obvious ones are going to intensive care and, uh, and CPR. And uh, so I will say, so uh, we'll do all that we can to make your wife better, but if her heart stops, uh, to the best of my opinion, uh, we will not be able to get that started again. And so we don't, we, we, we can't do that. And so I explain it that way, and I, and I usually put the, this, we're going to do everything that we can to make your wife better before the CPR won't work, so that people know that I am al aligned to what they want, uh, so that we are doing things uh, uh, for that patient, and we will do all that we can for that patient, rather than the sense that somehow that we're giving up on someone. In my experience, if we present it in that way, uh, then there'll be a range of responses. And there'll be a range of responses from, my dad wouldn't want a resuscitation anyway, uh, uh, to, oh, I hadn't really thought about that, but that makes sense. Um, and, and about, I think, possibly 80 or 90% of people uh, where we have that discussion, if we do it, in that way, if we only present it as a choice when there is a choice to be made, then people understand it and it's acceptable and, uh, and, and that all goes very smoothly. I suppose my guidance is, my, my thought is, that uh, you think about how quickly you need to make this decision. Uh, so if this is someone who is still, uh, n you're not expecting them to die for for a few weeks, if it's a, a discussion that you're having in advance, then you may just leave it. Uh, because as time goes on, that person is going to become more poorly, uh, and it may become more obvious to people that it makes sense uh, at a later stage. Um, and there's always that balance between the distress that you're going to cause by imposing a decision that is uh, uh, that, that, that doesn't make sense to somebody, and the distress that comes from a resuscitation attempt that doesn't work, uh, and all of the all of the difficulties around that, and you kind of want to balance those two things up, and you take a judgment about whether you're going to risk the cardiac arrest that where you don't have a form, or whether you're going to risk the imposing distress on the patient or on the family at the moment. Um, I think in. In the, in the story that that's in this video, um, there wasn't really a lot of time that, you know, the, the lady was very poorly, 
the operation was the next day, there was a chance that the patient might arrest. There's a chance that the, this lady's heart might stop at any point in the next 24, 48 hours. So you need to make a decision. Um, and and there's, only, there's only two decisions. One is that you go, this family are very upset, so we're going to do a, um, a, a we're going to attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation even though we really, really don't think it'll work. Or there's a going through a process to uh, agree a DNA CPR decision even though the family don't agree with it. And those are your two, those are your two options. So you can do the first one. I've done that sometimes. Uh, and sometimes it feels the right thing to do. Although often the struggle for me is that I'm, I'm going to leave that for someone else to actually undertake the, the, the arrest attempt. And, and that feels uncomfortable to me. If you want to do the second, then as a junior doctor, then you say, I hear what you say. I will discuss this with my um, with my consultant, and it may be that the consultant needs to discuss it with the with the patient or the family. If at that point you still can't uh, make uh, come to an agreement, if you still can't find a way to uh, uh, agree that this won't work, then the uh, the, the policy the, uh, and, and nationally and legally the family or the patient is entitled to a second opinion and so that would be the next step is to say I hear what you're saying we've not come to an agreement and, and everyone's entitled to a second opinion and then you go and seek a second opinion and whether that's from a palliative care doctor or an intensive care doctor or another consultant that's a reasonable thing to do again with all the time you know there may be or may not be time constraints within that. If the second opinion agrees that CPR has no chance of working, then the doctors can make that decision. I would say that practically, if you're stuck, then go and find a good palliative care person because they've generally had more of these discussions and may be able to find a way, uh, way around it or a way to, uh, to help make sense of it.